Hey everyone, this time we read Super Mario Bros. 2 by John Irwin. This is another book from the Boss Fight book series, and this is kind of a strange one for me. I, I feel like I probably should have read this uh, probably about five years ago or so, because there's a lot of information in here that I already knew, and some of it I don't really agree with the way that John presents it, but that's kind of one of the joys of reading books. You don't necessarily have to agree with the authors all the time. So I really like about the first two-thirds of this book because John gives us a lot of history about Nintendo. Granted, this is information that's documented in other places, but it's still really interesting to have it just in this one book, and it's nice to kind of read it again. It was a nice refresher for myself, and for somebody who doesn't know a lot about Nintendo history, this might uh, be kind of informative for them. If you know a lot about Nintendo history, you might find a few things that uh, John gets wrong here, and if you know a lot about video game history overall, you're gonna see some errors that John makes. So just to simplify things here, when I refer to the Japanese Super Mario Bros. 2, I'll refer to that as the Lost Levels, and when I refer to the US version of Super Mario 2, I'll just refer to it as Super Mario 2. It's just a way to make things a little bit easier, and that way it won't cause too much confusion for you guys. So John explains that The Lost Levels was rejected by Nintendo of America, which makes a lot of sense, and he points out something that I hadn't really thought about, and that's the transcript or the conversation that must have happened between Nintendo of America and Nintendo of Japan. It must not have been a really easy conversation to have to say, hey, this game is no good, you guys, you know, we can't put this out in the US. Some of the reasons that they had for it were the graphics weren't all that great, or at least they weren't as improved as they could be. Because at this point the NES was a few years old, so you would have expected some graphical improvements. They also mentioned that at this time the video game industry was still recovering somewhat in the US specifically the home console market. After Atari and Coleco and Intellivision had been around and the market just got flooded with very bad games because there was really no quality control. It used to be that pretty much anybody could come up with a game and release it onto the market. Atari really wasn't able to do what Nintendo did and really corral the third-party developers, and so they lost control of what games were being put out on their system. Nintendo changed all of that with their licensing agreements. You can argue whether or not those agreements were really legal. It's kind of a strange thing that they got into. What Nintendo was most worried about was losing customer confidence. That was something that happened with Atari because they had no control over the products that were being released on their system. Nintendo changed that around quite a bit, and that's one of the big reasons why The Lost Levels wasn't released in the US. They were worried that people would play it and just kind of not really enjoy it, and they would start returning it in mass, much like what happened with Pac-Man and E.T. So instead, as John explains, they went ahead and reskinned Doki Doki Panic as Super Mario 2, and that's pretty much how we got here. The gaming historian went into a lot more detail on this, and I'll give a link to his video in the description below in case you guys want to check it out and learn a lot more than what you're probably going to learn from this video or from reading John's book. Another fun thing that's mentioned is that they were originally at least hoping to send out copies of the Lost Levels to Nintendo Power subscribers. This didn't happen, but it would have been kind of cool if that did take place. This wouldn't have been the first time that something like this happened, as Nintendo had sent out Dragon Quest as like a free copy to about a million Nintendo Power subscribers when they were trying to really like promote JRPGs in the United States. One thing that kind of seemed a little bit out of place for me, at least at first, but eventually made a lot more sense as to why it was here, was John talking about how video games got more complex over time. He keeps referring back to arcades, like the single-screen arcades, and talking about the evolution to more side-scrollers. Arcade games in the late 70s and early 80s all really just used a single screen. Donkey Kong, Pac-Man, uh, Missile Command, they 
all usually just used one screen, and maybe had a few different variations of that screen. It was just an easy way for the developers to, one, use what they had at the time, and two, uh, be able to control the action and everything, and try to make the games as much as possible. But as you went on, the games got much more complex. There's a lot more things going on on the screen, and it was just something that they had to keep doing in order to keep up with technology. There were some experiments with vector graphics, and also a scrolling in video games like Atari's Football and Defender, and a few other games like that, until eventually they got to more of the side-scrolling shooters and more complex arcade games. What he also briefly touches on is how much like on the screen here, it's very different for some Other video games that do this as well, like Nami did with Simon's Quest, very different Castlevania, and also Nintendo did it again with like three different John also spends a lot of time talking about the progression of Mario through his very first early years on you know, Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., and then on to the original Mario Brothers arcade. He talks a lot about the arcade game being built on a cylinder, which is technically true as you can go from one side of the screen to the other, and you don't necessarily move to a different part of the map. It's really kind of a cool thing that's been used in a bunch of arcade games. John also talks about how the games came full circle, with the lost levels eventually being released in the United States, and Super Mario Bros. 2 being released in Japan. In the United States, the lost levels first showed up on the Super Mario All Stars on the Super Nintendo after they did some graphical adjustments to the game. Super Mario Bros. 2 showed back up in Japan as Super Mario Bros. USA. I'm not really too sure about how well it sold, but I do know from what John says in the research that he did that it got panned by critics mostly because it was just a rehash and kind of a simplified version of Doki Doki Panic. That was something that I didn't really know about, and it's kind of cool to read about in this book. As much as I do have a few problems with the book, there are some things in here that are very interesting. And it's really an easy read for people to get through. Probably the one thing that I was really the most disappointed about with this book is when John brings up playing the game. And some of the other video game books that I've seen from the Boss Fight series so far, they wrap their narrative around them playing through the game. John doesn't really do that, or if he did, it's very subtle and I didn't really notice it. But with the other ones I've read, they make it more of a point, saying this is something that I was really doing in my life, or this is an experience in my life, and it relates to this part in the game in this way. John tries to go the history route, but also bring in his own personal reflections of playing the game, and it doesn't really work for me as I'm reading through this. So there's a lot of really good information in the book, but I don't necessarily like the narrative, and there's kind of a lot of factual errors in it that I don't really like, and that I just couldn't really get past while I was reading it. I don't really recommend this book for somebody that really studies video game history. There are better resources out there where you can go and get more information on Super Mario Bros. 2. If you don't know anything about Super Mario Bros. 2, and you're not really studying video game history, th this is a decent book that you can pick up and get sort of the gist of what's going on, and maybe it inspires you to dig a little bit deeper into things. Anyway guys, that's gonna wrap it up for me. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the episode. I know it's a little bit weird, and I, personally, I didn't really like the book that much, but, you know, that's just the way it goes sometimes. Anyway, please leave your comments uh, in the description. Anyway, please let me know what you think in the comments below. I really do appreciate hearing back from you guys. 
I'll talk to you all later and have a great day.